In this video, I want to talk about the insulin receptor and PI3K AKT signaling pathways. I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about insulin. You've probably heard of insulin. It's the major hormone involved in regulating blood sugar levels. Really, it's the major hormone that's involved in regulating energy balance in the whole body. And that's why I've drawn this cartoon here of an exploded body to talk about how insulin acts. Let's first consider what happens when you're fasted, when you're hungry. Well, if you haven't eaten for a while, there won't be anything in your stomach. You won't be taking in any glucose. Under these circumstances, the major source of sugar for your body comes from the liver. The liver has a store of glycogen it can break it down into glucose, and that maintains a constant blood glucose level. This is aided by fat tissue. Fat has stores in the form of triglycerides. They can be broken down into glycerol and the free fatty acids, and those can then enter the bloodstream, get taken up by the liver, where they can be converted into glucose through gluconeogenesis. No matter whether the liver is breaking down glycogen or doing gluconeogenesis, the glucose that it produces is released into the bloodstream, and there it can travel through the body. And under fasted conditions, it's going to be taken up by tissues that absolutely need it, such as the brain. Importantly, other tissues, such as skeletal muscle and fat tissue, do not take up much glucose in this fasted state. They have to rely on their own reserves. Well, what happens in the fed state? Well, under these circumstances, chances are that you are absorbing glucose from your digestive tract. The increased glucose in the blood will signal cells in the pancreas, the beta cells, to release insulin into the bloodstream. And then insulin can exert its effects on a whole bunch of different tissues. One of the things that insulin will do is it will promote glucose uptake in muscles and fat cells, the tissues that weren't taking it up before. In addition, it will stimulate muscle to use glucose and to increase glycogen synthesis. Similarly, in fat cells, it will increase lipid synthesis. In the liver, it will promote glycogen synthesis and it will decrease gluconeogenesis. Disruptions in insulin or insulin signaling are linked to the disease diabetes. This is one of the most common diseases. It affects about 10% of Americans, although many people with diabetes do not realize that they have the disorder. Because diabetes is so common, and because it can have devastating effects, it's important to understand how insulin signaling works if we want to come up with effective therapies and treatments. Let's go ahead and look at the insulin signaling pathway now. Here's a cartoon of the insulin receptor, which is a receptor tyrosine kinase. It looks a little bit different from other receptor tyrosine kinases that we've seen because it's a tetramer. There are two extracellular alpha subunits, there are two intracellular beta subunits, and these are all linked together by disulfide bonds. That's what the staples indicate. I've colored one half of the receptor red and the other half yellow because each half is originally synthesized as a single protein that then is processed in the Golgi and cleaved into the subunits. Like other receptor tyrosine kinases, the extracellular part will bind the ligand, they'll have insulin binding domains, and the intracellular part will have the tyrosine kinase activity. However, Unlike other receptor tyrosine kinases, it exists as a stable monomer, even when no insulin is around. Chemists have been able to visualize the structure of the insulin receptor, and in this inactivated state, it looks like an upside-down V. In that shape, it's off. Well, if we add insulin, the insulin will come and bind to the receptor. Here I've drawn two insulin molecules binding to the receptor. A popular model posits that two molecules bind. There's some recent work that suggests that a single molecule may bind, and there's some even more recent work that suggests that poor insulin molecules may bind, so take that with a grain of salt. The important thing is that when the receptor binds insulin, however many it takes to activate it, there's a conformational change. And notably what I want you to see is that the cytoplasmic parts have been drawn close together. This allows the receptor to do trans-autophosphorylation. The cytoplasmic domains will reach over, phosphorylate one another, and the receptor now has this T-shape, which is on. The phosphotyrosines on the cytoplasmic domains attract scaffolding proteins. There are a number of different proteins that can be recruited. One example would be SHC, sarcomology and collagen family member. It binds to the phosphotyrosine, and then it can get phosphorylated by the insulin receptor, and that then can allow it to bind to other proteins. In this case, it can bind the protein GERB2, which in turn can recruit son of 7 lists and activate the ras math kinase signaling pathway. I've talked about this in a previous video, so I won't go over it again. Suffice it to say it's involved in cell proliferation and mitosis. 
What I do want to focus on is another type of scaffolding protein called the insulin receptor substrate. There are a few different types of this, six different family members. These will be the major effectors for the metabolic actions of insulin. Once the insulin receptor is phosphorylated, it can recruit the insulin receptor substrate to bind to that phosphotyrosine. The name insulin receptor substrate tells us that it's a substrate for the insulin receptor, so it'll be phosphorylated on tyrosines by the catalytic domains of the insulin receptor. Once phosphorylated, other proteins can be attracted to the IRS. In particular, there's a protein called phosphoinositide 3 kinase, PI3K, which can be recruited to the membrane. PI3K is an enzyme that catalyzes the phosphorylation of PIP2, adding a phosphate group so it produces PIP3, phosphatidylinositol trisphosphate. It's an enzyme so it can catalyze this reaction multiple times. And what's important to remember here is that while the cell normally has PIP2 in the membrane, it doesn't normally have PIP3. So when PIP3 shows up, new things can happen. There are a number of different proteins present in the cell that can bind to the PIP3. For example, there's a kinase called phosphoinositide-dependent protein kinase 1, PDK1, that will be recruited to the membrane and bind there. And as the name suggests, it's dependent on this association in order to be activated. Another protein that can be recruited is protein kinase B, which is also called AKT, and that's also drawn up to the membrane. And remember how I said that PDK could be activated if it's brought to the membrane? Well, one of the substrates for PDK is AKT, so it in turn can catalyze the phosphorylation of AKT. Now by itself, this isn't enough to activate the AKT protein. However, if it's also phosphorylated by mechanistic target of rapamycin complex 2, mTORC-C, well then we'll have fully activated PKB AKT and this kinase has many targets in the cell. Activated AKT is involved in stimulating glucose transport, in glycogen synthesis, and lipid synthesis. It can lead to protein synthesis. It can affect the cell cycle, and it can also lead to proliferation and survival. I'm not going to talk about all of these. I'm going to focus on the metabolic targets of AKT. Before leaving this slide, though, I do want to make a couple of points. The first is I want to warn you that what I'm telling you isn't a complete story about all of the possible insulin signaling pathways. There are other adapter proteins in addition to SHC and IRS, and proteins other than PI3 kinase can be recruited to the insulin receptor substrate. There are also other targets downstream of PI3K other than AKT. There's one more point to make. You may have noticed how important phosphorylation is in activating this pathway. Well, there is a phosphatase, an enzyme that can remove these phosphate groups and regulate this pathway for almost every single step. For example, PIP3 can be broken down to PIP2 with the phosphatase PTEN. Okay, well, let's look at the metabolic effects, and I'm going to begin by talking about glucose transport. Remember, that happens in muscle and fat cells. In response to insulin, they will start taking up glucose from the blood. How does that happen? Here's my generic muscle or fat cell. Out here would be the bloodstream. And remember that at the start of the video I said that there is glucose, a constant level of glucose usually present in the bloodstream. However, this glucose does not enter the cells. And the reason for that is because these cells lack the transporter proteins that are necessary for glucose to pass through the plasma membrane and enter the cell. It isn't that the cells don't make glucose transporters, they do. The body has several different kinds of glucose transporters and in muscle and fat cells, the predominant form is GLUT4. GLUT4 is made and gets packaged into the GLUT4 storage vesicles. And then although those vesicles have the V snares and the T snares that you might think would lead to membrane fusion, it's a regulated process. This is regulated exocytosis. And there are a number of different proteins that will prevent the V snares and the T snares from fusing. One of the most important is a small G protein called RAB. Like other G proteins, if it's bound to GTP, it is in the on state. And if that were true, then fusion could happen. However, what normally happens in these cells is that there's another protein called AS160, also called TBC1D4, that is a RAB GTPase activating protein. Now what that means is that when AS160 is associated with 
RAB, it will activate RAB's intrinsic GTPase activity so that any GTP will rapidly be hydrolyzed into GDP. And under those circumstances, the G protein will be off. No fusion. So what's going to happen then if we add insulin? Well, the insulin will bind to the insulin receptor. We get activation of protein kinase B, AKT. And one of the targets for AKT is AS160. It will add a phosphate group. That's what the name AS160 means. It's AKT substrate of 160 kilodaltons. Once AS160 is phosphorylated, it can associate with yet another protein. It will release its effect on RAB, and now RAB is free to pick up a GTP, and when that happens, we'll get fusion, and the GLUT4 proteins can be inserted into the plasma membrane so that now glucose can enter the cell, increasing the amount of glucose in the muscle or the fat cell. There are other targets for AKT. Vesicles can also be tethered to the actin cortex, and so there are targets for AKT that will lead to the release from the cytoskeleton. In addition, in the fasted state, the cell will normally be internalizing the GLUT4 vesicles, and there are targets of AKT that can slow down that process so that the receptors that are placed in the plasma membrane remain there. That's one important action of insulin, increasing the glucose uptake. What about other things? What about the role for glycogen synthesis and about lipid synthesis? Let's look at those. I'll show you how insulin regulates glycogen synthesis using the liver as an example. So here's my liver, and I've got the hepatocytes, the cells that are making up the liver there. We'll blow one up so we can look at it. Well, liver cells are able to take up glucose. They do this in an insulin-independent way. Remember that I said that there's more than one type of glucose transporter? Liver cells express the GLUT2 transporter, and that's always present. It's constitutively present in the membranes, so that glucose is always able to move in or out of the liver cells. When glucose is taken up by liver cells, it can be fed into glycolysis in the tricarboxylic acid cycle to make energy, or it can be stored in the form of glycogen. That's what that feathery structure on the left is. The amount of glycogen is controlled by the activity of two enzymes. Glycogen synthase produces glycogen, and then the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase will break down glycogen, releasing glucose molecules that can then be released to the rest of the body. Well, obviously it wouldn't make sense to have both of these enzymes active at the same time, so they're highly regulated. Let's look at what happens first in the fasted state. Under those circumstances, the body is going to want to access the store of glucose that's present in the liver in the form of glycogen. Notice that my cartoon of the glycogen phosphorylase enzyme is phosphorylated. That's what it takes to be active, but it can also be switched into an inactive state when it's not phosphorylated. Phosphorylation is controlled by an enzyme called phosphorylase kinase. When you're hungry, phosphorylase kinase will be on and will be phosphorylating glycogen phosphorylase, and glycogen will be broken down. Another thing that happens in the fasted state is that there's a transcription factor, FOXO1, and that's involved in turning on genes that are involved in gluconeogenesis. So again, if we're hungry, we'll be expressing the genes we need in order to go and make glucose from non-sugar sources, such as free fatty acids or proteins. Well, what happens if you're fed? Well, in the fed state, we're going to want to activate glycogen synthase, and this is where insulin comes in. Glycogen synthase can also be switched between an active and an inactive state. In this case, the dephosphorylated version is more active. There's a phosphatase called protein phosphatase 1, and if it's active in the cell, it will clip off that phosphate group and will have active glycogen synthase. There's also a kinase called glycogen synthase kinase 3, which, if it's active, will phosphorylate the glycogen synthase and move it into the inactive form. So when we add insulin and it binds to its receptor and activates AKT, we're going to need to set the switch so that glycogen synthase will be active. This happens because AKT can phosphorylate GSK3. This shuts GSK3 off. AKT can also phosphorylate protein phosphatase 1, and this will then promote, again, the activation of glycogen synthase. And the presence of insulin will also deactivate phosphorylase kinase so that the glycogen phosphorylase will be shut off and we won't be breaking the glycogen down. Finally, I'll show you one more target for AKT, and that's going to be FOXO.
AKT can phosphorylate FOXO1. When it does this, it blocks FOXO from entering the nucleus. And if FOXO is not, in, and if the transcription factor isn't in the nucleus, it won't be turning on the genes necessary for gluconeogenesis. Now let's look at insulin actions on lipid metabolism, and here we're going to be looking at fat cells. Zoom in on one. By far the most distinct characteristic of fat cells is that they have this really huge lipid droplet. The fat droplets are surrounded by a layer of proteins called perilipins. There are also a number of enzymes that are associated with the lipid droplet. I won't draw them all. I'll draw one, though. It's hormone-sensitive lipase, and this is going to be an enzyme that, if activated, will break down the triglycerides in the lipid droplet and release the free fatty acids into the bloodstream. In the fasted state, HSL will be on. That has to do with the fact that adrenergic signaling working through a GPCR-coupled receptor can activate protein kinase A. Protein kinase A phosphorylates the lipase and the perilipin molecules, and this allows mobilization of the lipids. Well, in the fed state, that's when insulin will reverse this process. So the addition of insulin leads to activation of a phosphodiesterase, and that can switch the pKa back into the inactive state, blocking the activity of HSL and blocking the breakdown of lipids. In addition, insulin activates pKb AKT in this system, and there are a number of targets, some of which get phosphorylated and turned on, others of which get turned off. But together what they do is they increase the activity of a transcription factor called SREBP1C. And that transcription factor is involved in turning on the genes that are involved in making new lipids. So what this means is that when insulin is present, we'll stop breaking down the lipids and instead make new lipids. Well, I know I've talked about a lot in this video about insulin, about the signaling pathways, and then the specific targets in different types of tissues. This is a complicated system, but it's incredibly important. Animals need to regulate blood sugar levels, and disruptions in this can have dire consequences.